<laughs> front. Okay. And uh, now we're doing live stream too, so it's day five already. So if you haven't seen day one, two, three, four, you might want to check those out too. But this is day five, and it's Ajahn Brahm's turn to give a Dhamma talk, and after that, a guided meditation. So welcome, Ajahn. Good welcome, afternoon. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> and the time is, we're not late, it's just the sun goes around a bit too fast sometimes. So we have to just slow down and just make peace. To be in the present moment, not be a prisoner of time. Remember I said that in one of the first talks, in order to just to be here right now. And because that you are wondering when it was going to start, remember last night I said, I think it was, that always to remember, last night my time, yesterday, I don't know, sometime your time, that it was uh, to two types of waiting, patience, waiting in the moment or waiting in the future, waiting for something to happen or waiting right now. And this is why part of those uh, little wonderful ways of teaching meditation to people who haven't got quite an idea what it is. And they think they, they're always having an internal conversation, always think they're restless and they don't know how to be silent, be peace and feel meditation. Meditation is an emotional state, not an intellectual state. And to show that, there's a little trick which I've often done before, and if you haven't heard this before, here it comes. That when I give a talk, especially if it's a talk on meditation, I ask people not just to be aware of what I say, but the reaction you have in your mind. Because as I am talking, you will start to notice some gaps between my words. In those spaces, what was happening in your mind? For most of you, you'd have noticed that your mind was silent. You were waiting for me to start speaking again. And you didn't know when I would speak. In that beautiful waiting in this moment, you have silence. One of the reasons why I often say that I like learning from nature. There was a good question which came up yesterday. In question time, you don't have much chance to give a full answer, but the answer is so manifold in nature. There are so many opportunities for silence. I know sometimes people like to go to forests, but even forests, there's animals in that forest, and they're quite noisy. In uh, over there in UK or in Europe, this time of the year, it's silent because it's a winter time. And very often there's nobody around. We're fortunate during COVID time, hopefully, there is not many uh, aircraft in the sky. And so you can find some places are quiet. And if it's real nature, you can actually, <coughs> excuse me, real nature, there's so many beautiful places where it's so peaceful. And in that peace, in that silence, what are you missing? What do you want in that silence? You don't want anything because silence, especially for people who live in a very noisy world, is beautiful. It's restful. It's like liberation. It's like free. It's one of the reasons why nature is much more silent than the city or the town. And uh, the nature is much more silent than if you're living at home and got a TV on, making so much noise. It's wonderful to turn that TV off, turn everything off, and just listen, just close your eyes. Because when you close your eyes, as I mentioned, you're not seeing anything. And if it's a reasonably quiet place, the background noise vanishes. You're just seeing the beautiful forest inside of yourself. It's safe, it's peaceful, and the silence is something which, after a while, gives you so much joy and energy. 
That's the inner nature of yourself. But little by little, I love nature, but of course the best parts of nature for me are always the caves. You know that sometimes, sometimes many people like to go in places like Australia or in Europe during the summertime to oceans, and to beaches, but they are so noisy. And even if you can find an isolated beach, still that is very noisy. Just the sound of the, of the ocean. It's repetitive, but it's not as quiet as when you go to places like caves, which is one of the reasons of all parts of nature, it's the caves which I like the most. It's, and that's one of the reasons also why the Buddha, he used to describe meditation as a journey into the cave of the heart, Hadayan Guha, which means a, like an ordinary cave. It goes in there, it's dark, so you don't be, um, you're not disturbed by sounds. You're not sorry, you're not disturbed by sights. You're not disturbed by sounds either. In those caves which I've meditated in, it's so easy to meditate. I remember some of the caves I went to, the other people who like to live in caves are bats. And I do recall this one cave in the north of Thailand where oh, I spent four or five months in this monastery, for my six months, I think. I used to go in that cave after the morning dana every morning and stay in there till the afternoon meditating. And it was, I just enjoyed myself so much in there. But because there were so many bats, but they were silent in there, but you could smell their poo, the bat poo. And to this day, I associate bat poo with one of the most wonderful smells, delightful smells. It's weird. When I smell bat poo, oh, that smells delightful. The other smell I remember, which is also delightful, is like tar, you know, like coal tar, because after the Second World War, that most of the metal railings on the parks in London, especially the poor parks, poor parts of London, those parks in which I used to spend so much time playing football, they only had wooden railings on them. And those wooden railings to protect them from the weather were painted with tar. And I had a lovely childhood. And so to this day, when I smell that tar, it smells delightful. It's one of those uh, insights into what is delightful, what's not delightful. It's basically what you've conditioned yourself to associate happiness with. Beautiful memories from the past, delightful smells from the past. But anyway, just going from how we learn from nature, and most people will think like tar smells disgusting or bat poo is disgusting. But to me, it just, it's, uh, it's interpreted as some of the most beautiful times of my life, sitting in deep caves. And so I love nature. And you can see that it resonates with me as, as peaceful, delightful, and because it resonates with me peaceful and delightful, that means it, it's very easy to develop joy and happiness and safety there. When you can develop that safety and that joy and the happiness wherever you are, of course, it becomes very easy to meditate. Sometimes you wonder this why it is that a person is in a, a peaceful one place and it's easy to meditate. Other places are not so easy to meditate. Why is that? And sometimes it's just you know, psychologically how we regard the place in which we're meditating. If in the meditation hall in my monastery, I sort of sprinkled bat poo everywhere, then people, oh, this is disgusting, get it out of here. But for me, oh, my meditation would be even better than usual because it would allow me to actually to resonate with that beautiful experiences of the past and get some happiness up straight away. I feel safe, I feel welcome. And that would be allowing me to relax all my guards, to let go and allow things to be and get into some really nice meditations. Now, this is saying something about the place in which you meditate and how you can develop some happiness there. And so sometimes you find out the things which do inspire you, the things which you, you like, 
the things not mean sensually, but will make you feel safe and comfortable. And even, you know, sometimes the the hall in Bodhinyana Monastery, for years we've been meditating in that hall. And got the same carpet in there which we had 35 years ago. <laughs> it's amazing, it's still there, same old carpet. Of course, we don't sort of have parties in there, so you know it doesn't sort of wear out that much. But nevertheless, it's like that carpet has soaked in just the good energy of all the monks and nuns and lay people who have sat in that hall over 38 years. And that begins gives rise to like maybe 30 six years, give rise this beautiful energy. And some places do have energy. And especially the front of that hall, the Feng Shui master who was brought in there, and I wasn't told about the Feng Shui master uh, coming, just came in there, somebody else invited him in. And when he came in there, he said the front of that hall was incredibly powerful Feng Shui. I don't know what Feng Shui truly means, but I know you can feel some places are safe and energetic and powerful. You know, sometimes when you go and meditate, well, when you go to places like India, and you go and meditate in some of the holy places in India, the places where the Buddha lived, whoa, that's really powerful stuff there. It becomes so easy to meditate. It's as if like you're drawn in. You don't do it. It's like safe. It's like peaceful. The nature has been created in those places. When actually the nature has been created in those places, again, the safety is there, the peace is there, the energy is there. I don't know how many people over these years, they have difficulty, say, meditating on retreat, you know, where I live, in the retreat center, which is on the opposite side of the road to the monastery. And they walk over to the, the main hall in Bodhinyana, and it's easy. They get a big boost in their meditation because the nature on the outside has created this space for them where they're free, they feel welcome, it's easy to be kind, and the whole thing just allows you to go deeper into your mind and be more peaceful, to let go more. But there are times also because, you know, like when I used to travel and do many other things, Sometimes you're in a, a noisy place. What do you do? And <laughs> if you are in a noisy place, you can still create the nature in which you're meditating in. I mentioned this in brief the other day, but like creating a bubble, a bubble around yourself. You're using your imagination, you're using the power of your mind to create a bubble. And this is your little cave. A little place where you can meditate. No one else can come into your little bubble. And when you're meditating in there, it is quiet, it's peaceful. And I use that many, many times, but the most recent time which I used this bubble was uh, again uh, going what's the Thailand and waiting in uh, uh, Sukarnabhumi Airport, uh, Sawanabhumi Airport, sorry. So one of Bumi Airport, waiting there for an hour and a half for someone to arrive and just being able to go into a little bubble, just sitting in just the main areas, which were really noisy. And just closing your eyes, imagining a bubble, creating that bubble. And when you use your imagination, it's incredible just how powerful that can be. And later on during the guided meditation, there was a, a uh, a request to do a type of meditation which uh, people call the Buddha meditation now. And uh, where that came from was where sometimes I accept invitations to go to places where I've never been before. And this was supposed to be in a, a kids group over in Singapore. But the kids group into which I was invited to give some sort of talk early in the morning I didn't realize it was a kindergarten. In other words, you have three-year-olds and four-year-olds and some five-year-olds. And if you think it's hard teaching the Dhamma to the adults, imagine teaching a dependent origination to three, four, five-year-olds. <laughs> You've got to change the way you do things. You've got to innovate. And sometimes being put in difficult situations 
it's great through how you can innovate. You allow your mind to be peaceful and see what comes up. And a good example of that, I'm going to go back to this Buddha meditation, which I developed over in or first uh, innovated in a kindergarten school. I think it was called Little Flowers Kindergarten in Singapore somewhere. And even before then, I was invited to a primary school close by to you know, teach something about Buddhism. And this was in a very heavily Christian area of Perth. And of course, I accepted the invitation, didn't know what I was going to get into. And what I had to teach uh, were these 60 uh, children from grade one and grade two in the school. You know, the first years, I thought, my goodness, how can I teach Buddhism to grade ones and grade twos? And so what I did, they were all there sitting on the floor looking at me. And also because some of the parents were a bit sort of concerned about exposing their children to a Buddhist instead of a Christian, many of the parents were there and the teachers were there. And then I had to teach them. And what I said was a very wonderful simile. So just imagine, just no, no, not just imagine, sorry. I asked everybody, how many of the 60 kids sitting in front of me, how many like rice pudding? I don't know if you ever had rice pudding, but I used to have those, one of the sweets we used to ha have in the UK you know, when I was young. Rice pudding, just rice and milk and sugar and baked. It was quite nice. It was very cheap, so my parents were poor. Rice pudding. I said, how many of you like rice pudding? Now you can imagine what it was like in a class of 60 children you know, in a sort of big room. There's one or two of the kids put their hand up straight away. They did not like rice pudding. And another few kids looked around and they saw these two or three with their hands up. So they put their hand up as well. And these were only just you know, six or seven year olds. And then a few other kids put their hand up and they saw the hands were going up, so they put their hands up as well. And in two or three minutes, I had everybody, all their children in this, this little hall with their hands up, they agreed they, they did not like rice pudding. They didn't know what I was doing, where I was going with this. So I asked them to put their hands down. And after they put their hands down, then I asked, now, please put your hands up again if you have ever eaten rice pudding. And only about five or six kids put their hand up. And all the other kids laughed. And they got a message. Our likes and dislikes are conditioned by what we think we should like and what we think we shouldn't like. And this is one of the reasons why we have to be very careful with sometimes our cravings, our desires, and our way out of those desires. Even the kids realize that even the food they liked was conditioned into them. That was teaching them dependent origination in a way that they could understand. Where does desire come from? Our likes and dislikes come from. Then my own personal example of that, I go back to little gems and the kids in the school later, where that came from, I saw it very clearly for myself, I was growing up in London, a poor kid, but went to a quite a good school, scholarships. And then I was, had my first uh, drink of beer, British beer. I don't know how many of you drank beer. I wasn't a Buddhist at that time. It was just what young men would do. We drank beer. And so the first drink of beer which I had, I was actually almost gagging on it. It tasted disgusting. It was warm, bitter, and just bleh. But I couldn't express my true feelings that I didn't like it because I would lose all my friends if I was truthful. And just after just six months, I started to like it. An accumulated taste, 
the deliciousness of that beer was built solely on peer pressure, nothing more. And so you started to realize just all the things you found beautiful or ugly, where do they all come from? And every now and again, to be honest with you, that sometimes, you know, you see on news articles, people of uh, people like um, models or uh, singers, which I really liked when I was a young man. And I look at them now and just their fashion. Did I really think they were beautiful then? They don't look beautiful now. I'm not saying now they're aged, but just how they were then. And I often say, why did I think that was beautiful? It was because everyone else said it was beautiful. That's why. Beautiful, attractiveness. Where does that come from? Even many years later, going on pilgrimage to India, to the holy sites, we also stopped by the uh, Taj Mahal, so-called one of the wonders of the world. I remember just because I had time, just sitting in the shade, just looking at that. Why? Why is it beautiful? Or is it really beautiful? And to me, it was, it was just ordinary. I could not see the beauty in it. The only reason why it's deemed as beautiful is because many, many people say so. We believe what other people say. This is one of the reasons why many of the things which we desire and crave and attach to are not inher inherently full of happiness. It's just that what we're told we should be doing. How we think things should be beautiful. People tell us it's beautiful, isn't it? My answer is, is it? So little by little, just we question things. And when it comes down, and it's a great way of even kids could understand that. Why do you say you don't like rice pudding when you haven't ever eaten any before? And they understood that. But anyway, going to the, the, uh, the kindergarten kids over in, uh, Singapore, just they asked me, it's, it's WASAC time soon, uh, the, day of <coughs> the birth, enlightenment, passing away of the Buddha. Can you teach the children about this? Their parents are Buddhist. Oh, that's a tough one. But I did remember as a child myself that you'd love just, not just listening, but acting, play acting. To this day, I remember when one of the teachers in the first year at primary school, they said, now we're going to stand up, everybody. We're going to imagine we're trees. We put out our arms and we're standing in the windy forest. And we're standing in a windy forest. Close your eyes, imagine you're a tree, a huge tree. I remember that, that had an influence on me, even from such an early age, one of my earliest memories. So I said, okay, the Buddha's um, birth. According to the tradition, according to the tradition, when the Buddha came out of his mum's womb, that he walked seven steps, and then he put his finger up and said, this is my last birth, that uh, this I'm the chief of the world, or whatever it was. And so I asked all these three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds to do that. Okay, just stand still and walk seven steps, make a count, and imagine you're the Buddha being just after birth, doing that and saying that. And for those of you who sometimes think that kids can't speak, newborn babies can't speak, you may have heard me say this before, but I do listen and uh, accumulate some weird stories. And this story were two parents uh, in Perth many years ago. They were Westerners. And they weren't Christians or Buddhists. They were just ordinary people. And they would celebrate things like Christmas or something with their family. But they had two children. And their youngest child had just you know, come out of hospital with their mum. It just been poor, just a you know, couple of weeks old, I'd imagine. And they came to see me 
because they weren't Buddhists, they said, but we need to tell you something. Uh, what the heck's going on type of question. And we know that, you know, maybe you can, uh, you maybe can listen to us without thinking we're crazy. They said that when their child came home, it was time for the older child to go to bed, Peter and Paul or something. I changed their names because I don't want the family just to be embarrassed. But there were Caucasians. And I, the mother told the eldest son, uh, Peter, go and say good night to your young brother and then go to bed. And so Peter went up to his baby brother, good night, Paul. And Peter said, good night, Peter, back. He was only one or two weeks old. And that really shocked them. Mum and dad heard it. And without being asked, the elder son, Peter, said again to his baby brother, good night, Paul. And this time with both of them paying full attention, full mindfulness. When something like that happens, your mindfulness turns up in, in its intensity. You're really listening. And it said it again. Good night, Peter. It was a two-week-old baby talking. I don't know if any of you have had those experiences, hearing kids that young speak when they're not supposed to be able to speak. But I've accumulated a couple of those stories over the years. You know, people who say we didn't tell anybody because they think we were mad. But the best story, and I think Aya Chanda knows this one, was when in a United States maternity ward, when the child came out of the womb, still attached to the umbilical cord, the child looked around and it spoke. But the words it spoke, which is always, I'll never forget. The words it spoke were, oh no, not again. <laughs> That's what it's like if you can remember your previous life and you come into a baby, oh my goodness, nappies again, going to school again, not being able to express what you need to your mum and dad. Oh, there's a lot of, lot of trouble happening there in your rebirth. But anyway, the, so I got the kids to imagine there were the Buddha just being born. And then Buddha becoming uh, enlightened. That was the one which was fantastic. I'm going to come back on that in a moment. The Buddha passing away. And I asked those kids to lay on their back, lay on their, their sides, their right side, with their hand just underneath their right ear and their uh, left leg on top of the right leg, as straight as they possibly could. And that's the statue which they had in this little Buddhist kindergarten. So they could see it, they could imagine it, and they could actually do that. And imagine that now you're passing away. No more attachments, no more worries. Everything calm and peaceful. You've done your job, now's the time to disappear. And they really got into that. <laughs> but they, not just not they got into it, the teachers and the parents were also doing it, show their kids how it was done. But actually, the parents and teachers, they were enjoying it to the max. They said, carry on, please just you know, don't get us out of this little meditation. But even more powerful than that was the Buddha's enlightenment. And you'd all seen how the Buddha would sit down comfortably under a Bodhi tree and just cross his legs, close his eyes and just become our Buddha, fully enlightened. And I, I taught the kids through this, what it meant, sit comfortably and imagine, just imagine you're sitting under this, this, this shady tree. And in those days, where the Buddha became enlightened in Bodhgaya, it was called Uruwela. And it was a place where a big park was there. There wasn't a forest or a jungle. There was a park next to a, a, a beautiful river, the Nirangela River. And that morning, the Buddha had 
had a beautiful meal, which was made for a heavenly being. And this lady Sujata had decided to actually make an offering. It was a full moon day uh, to Devas, heavenly beings who live in trees, and to give that meal at, at the foot of the tree and saw the Buddha there, and so decided to give the meal to the Buddha instead. So the Buddha had a delicious meal made for heavenly beings. He sat under a beautiful tree. But I remember just as a, as a young man, was it 1980, no, 1972 or three or something, going over to Bodh Gaya. It was a rainy season, but there was hardly anybody there. You know, maybe just because Buddhism wasn't that popular in the Western world in those days, but you could walk around and there was hardly any, no beggars, there's no sort of drums or sounds or anything. I remember the first time I went to Bodh Gaya, and you can understand just what it must have been like in the days when the Buddha was there, even more peaceful, less people around, and next to a beautiful river. It would have been like idyllic. It would be like a park. And that's where he would meditate. And I was telling the kids this as they had their eyes closed. And you were getting the sense of safety and happiness and joy there. And then imagining this breeze blowing over the, over the, uh, the park, hardly any mosquitoes or no sounds, no sounds of cars, no sounds of aircraft, no sort of disturbance at all. You're under this tree. And imagine then what it's like when you're enlightened, nothing more to do in this world. Everything is finished and done. Everything, nothing more to aspire to, nothing more you need. You're perfectly, fully enlightened. But even the kids understood just there's nothing more to be done and we're relaxing. So often in our world, we think we better get this finished and get this done, otherwise we get criticized or we get punished or we put in detention or something especially in places like Singapore. But now they felt free. All the work they ever needed to do was finished. No more fears of anything in the future. You've done your job, peaceful, not wanting or aspiring for anything. And it was such a powerful meditation that when they, even the kids came out afterwards, they didn't really want to open their eyes, but the parents, the parents said, that was great. Can you teach that to us in the evening talk? Of course, that's what I did. And that became the, what I call the Buddha meditation. It's not just recollecting the qualities of a Buddha, it's actually feeling them, getting that emotional truth of what meditation really is. You know, first of all, you imagine it, but imagine what it feels like. You've just been enlightened. You have nothing more to do in this world. Nothing is missing, nothing you need. I mean, I really mean that. No aches and pains. If there are any aches and pains, it's just, they hardly affect you at all. You're at peace with the whole world. Nothing needed. Done what had to be done. You don't need anything in the whole world. And that feeling of peace and stillness, Everybody felt that, and even I really enjoyed it. And so I've often done that, not too, not too often, because sometimes when you repeat it too many times, it loses its edge. And sometimes I wonder, why? Is that a really good way of meditating? It's, it's using your imagination. It's using your, your feeling to try and get these ideas of what being a Buddha must be like. And straight away, it frees you from so many concerns. Our problem is, is that whatever we, we aspire to, we want, we get stressed that way. It's, as I said the other day, it's one of the definitions of suffering in the Dhammachaka Pawatana Sutta, separation from where you want to be. Here I am, and I want to be somewhere else. I want to, to have none of this suffering or none of this illness or whatever, that itself 
is a stress. Here I am and I don't want to be here. I want to be somewhere else. So because of that, there is, I think I attend and there's this wonderful little um, cartoon. There was a cartoon in, I think, four, um, four little drawings. This man came to see, let's call it, this man came to see the nun. I want happiness. He had on a, um, a placard, like one of the protesters, which you see every time in the, in the newspapers in the world. I want happiness. And came to see the nun. And the nun said, first mistake, I. So she rubbed that out of his poster. He was still unhappy. Want happiness. Second mistake. Want. And she rubbed that out. And then what was left? He showed the guy happiness. And both of them were smiling. Problem solved. It was such a simple little uh, teaching, but incredibly powerful. I want happiness. Problem is I. Problem is want. When you get the I out and the want out, what's left? Happiness. So little by little, you know, we we actually learn just what is the obstacles to meditation. And those obstacles to meditation, I want peace. Simple solution. Take off the idea of I. It's not about you anymore. Not doing this as a personal attainment. So as mentioned yesterday, but I didn't say it fully. Ajahn Chah would always say, you meditate to let go, to disappear, to renounce, not to get things. The idea is that your idea of me, I, is vanishing. And what? What do you want in this world? I want happiness. <laughs> It's the wanting, it's the obstacle to getting happiness. You rub, off, you rub off the eye, you rub off the want, and all that's left is happiness. The Buddha said it is letting go of desire. Sometimes I said it that the problem is that uh, suffering, suffering is asking from this world something it can never give you. That again was a, a, an answer to a question which a Singaporean asked me. He came to see me, he said, look, I'm really busy. I've got to go to work. I've only got a couple of minutes. You know, teach me Buddhism. <laughs> it was a crazy idea to teach you Buddhism in a couple of minutes. But, you know, you rose to the occasion and it happened. Suffering is asking from this world something it can never give you. So what can't this world give you? If you don't ask for that, then of course you're at peace. So this idea of learning just how to be, wherever you are, not trying to get somewhere else. I want a nice monastery. That's what I want for my agenda. I want a nice place. I was telling the monks today that you know, if I haven't told you, listen to this, I did really years ago, I made a suggestion, the best and most worthy place for a Bikuni monastery in UK. <laughs> Buckingham Palace. It's underused and poor old Queen Elizabeth. She's getting old now. And so she should be moving in like everybody else into an old person's home or something. <laughs> Oh, she's a really, I've met her, she's a really nice woman. But why waste that beautiful, it's right in the center of the city. It's, it's really reasonably quiet inside, it's got many rooms. Imagine going on a retreat. All the rooms are already there. You've got lots of food there and security. You wouldn't have to do anything, Ayatana, just sit there and all the guards will look after you. 
and just feed you. You've got these beautiful gardens in the back where you can do your walking meditation. Imagine having a, a Buddhist retreat, a meditation retreat in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> I'm sure lots of people will go. <laughs> but anyway. But anyway, just sometimes that you may wish for those things. There's a wanting them causes the suffering. And in the end, what happens in life? Nearly all the wonderful places which have fallen into my lap. Bodhinyana Monastery, Dhammasawa Nance Monastery. Just all of those places, it was just, time was right, they just came really easily. It's one of the reasons why the suffering is wanted. You don't, you don't want, and better things happen. It's amazing what happens in life. You just see what happens, go with the flow. Go here, go there. But it's all nice stuff, whatever happens. So anyway, there we go, rambling on for a while. But when you feel safe and feel contented, you can imagine just sitting wherever you are, any place in the world, closing your eyes, using your imagination. Imagine you're just in both in your uh, imagine you're in, in Bodh Gaya. Imagine that all the things you ever wanted in the world, you don't want anything anymore. You're free. Freedom of desire is never ever as good as freedom from desire. You'll never get all the things you want. Never. You let go of wanting. You realize you never wanted them anyway, really. The only thing you really ever wanted was peace, stillness, contentment, the freedom from this constant, you have to do something more. You said you have to do something more. You put that burden down, you rest. You rest your body, you rest your mind and believe it or not, you don't fall asleep. You get so content, so energized. In the evening, you can't fall asleep. You're just too alive. So anyway, there's a few little words on just letting go, letting go of wanting, using imagination using your emotions to, 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 to uh, develop by imagination, where you get a taste of freedom, seeing and feeling what the Dhamma is truly like. Okay, so I've run out of time again. And so uh, we can do a toilet break. And after the toilet break, we'll do the Buddha meditation as requested. Is that okay? Thank okay. You. So, toilet a break, and then we're back. <laughs> so, Ajanya, you're not um, taking that carpet out anymore, are you, from the Dhamma Hall? I don't know. Okay. Just, you don't even think about it. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> okay. Because if you ever do take it out. Yeah. I'm not going to send it to Wink. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> no, it's just, it's not just a carpet. It's just the, uh, sometimes I really wonder about myself or my no-self or whatever you want to call it, because you, know, you were trained, conditioned if you like, and it's part of my condition, which I will not abandon, is of just you need evidence before you, you say such things. But that hall is just too powerful. Oh, yeah. You know that time, for those I'm just chatting along, that time I did a six-month retreat, by myself, I never saw a human being for six months. 
fantastic time. Lots of nice meditation. But in the Kuti, I didn't know about this until after, a few days afterwards, the Kuti, the heart in which I spent six months, total seclusion, only seeing animals, never seeing, seeing uh, human beings. That at the end of that retreat, the monks were really excited and they were having all these little, almost like arguments, who can move in there next? And this German monk was the one who won that little competition. He was going to move in as soon as I moved out. And he told me afterwards that when he moved in, he couldn't stay in there. He said it was too powerful. The energy was too much for him. And so he went somewhere else for a few days and <laughs> it cooled off a bit. <laughs> and he was a really nice monk. And uh, very intelligent. But I said, yeah, I, I didn't realize how energized that part was because I was just sitting in all the time. But afterwards, whoa, it's powerful. And you, can, you can actually feel it. One of the other times I remember just going over to, landed in one of those uh, visits to uh, the holy sites, landed in Kathmandu, had a day in Kathmandu, and visit the palace, and I was getting bored, I just want to meditate. But anyway, that I wandered off like a naughty, naughty monk, naughty tourist away from the group, and just went into one of these doors in the palace, and inside, oh, that was such black energy. I didn't know where I was going, I was just exploring. It was very dark and, and depressing energy. That was where they uh, would um, sacrifice animals according to the Hindu tradition of that place. You see the posts there. That's a place to be very difficult to meditate and get a lot of peace. You have to do a lot of loving kindness before that could warm up. But, whew, places do have energy. And it's very sim pretty simple to feel those places. Were you a monk, Ajahn, at that time? Yeah, a monk, yeah. Oh, okay. But you're with the lay group. They were Buddhists, but, you know, they wanted to go and see see this and see that. So you just tagged along with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall we start the meditation? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just uh, chilling out. We call the day today. <laughs> okay, here we go. So the meditation we're going to do today. If you don't want to follow the meditation which I'm doing, you can always just. It's one of the great things with the Zoom retreat. You can mute me or turn the sound down and do your own meditation. But I really enjoy this, and it was uh, it was requested. So this is the Buddha meditation. <clears throat> So, first of all, sit yourself comfortably down, as I'm doing. <laughs> and close your eyes. First of all, just to make sure your body is reasonably comfortable. Remember the place in Bord Gaia under this beautiful Bodhi tree, it's cool. And the Buddha, the shady, the Buddha got himself a nice safu to sit on, got some grass from the, the forest and made himself a nice little seat. We just had a beautiful meal. Reasonably in the morning time, we sat down after his meal, and closed his eyes and made sure he was really comfortable. And after a while, he became our Buddha. And just imagine that's you, where you're sitting down, I'm not sure, it may not be in India, it may not be under a Bodhi tree, it may be in your, your little home, wherever you are sitting. I'm sitting in this office in Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth. The trees are outside. 
and sitting here, you imagine, you use those powers of imagination. Just imagine you are just being enlightened, fully enlightened. Another hut, just imagine that. Because you're enlightened, you have nothing to prove to anybody in the whole world. You don't have to live up to any people's expectations. You're free from all desires and measurements. More importantly for many of you, you have nothing to do in the world. What's done, or rather what had to be done, has been done. Many times when we do work for ourselves or for our own business or for our Buddhist societies or for our monasteries, that work is never finished. There's always more cleaning to do, more adjustments to do, more talks to give if you're a teacher. But just imagine the feeling inside is there's nothing more to be done. What had to be done has been done. So you don't need to plan anymore. There's nothing left to be done. You're enjoying this moment. There's no anxiety, which often takes us into the future, trying to ensure we don't get hurt again. No anxiety because there's nothing missing anymore. Nothing left to be achieved or to be enjoyed. Everything so peace. Just like you really have a holiday now. Not a holiday where you have to worry about how you're going to get back into the country afterwards with all the COVID regulations. Not having to be concerned about what's in your baggage or not baggage because now you're in light, you don't really have baggage anymore. Let go of the whole past. Whoever did what to you, whatever you did, all of that past is forgiven and let go of. You are free. There's nothing which belongs to you anymore. It may be scary at first, having no name and no roots, no identity, but you really are peaceful. You don't need anything anymore. What's done has been done. There is no more suffering in the world for you. That which comes up, rising and passing away of things, you know, that's, that is suffering too. But it's not the same depth of suffering. There's nothing you can do with it. You leave it alone. It's not yours. You're totally free. Imagine that you're sitting down. And it's almost impossible to think about the future. Because the present moment is so perfect and pure. There's nothing left to be done. There's no more wanting inside of you. Very often, right until the end of our lives, we're always trying to learn something more, to do something more, to gain something more, to own something more. Now you don't need any of that at all you have is more than enough. You have peace, wisdom, 
freedom. You can appreciate the freedom of desires is far less than the freedom from desires. Just imagine having no desires at all in your mind. No wanting. Just imagine what that must feel like. This moment is good enough. You don't desire it to be anything else. You don't desire it to last. It's free. The end of all desires, all wanting, all work. Work is trying to achieve your desires. There may be wonderful, good, good desires for the benefit of others as well. <coughs> but how much more benefited it is to be a Buddha, to be fully enlightened. So what? And nothing in the whole world. You sit in here at peace because there's nothing to disturb you. All wanting is gone. When you let go of the future, you really are in this present moment. There's no place for wanting to land. It's like a bird which takes off wanting some destination, but there's no destination anymore. You have everything you ever wanted and needed. Peace, contentment. If you're still aware of your body, feel it. It's good enough. Go back into your mind. What did you want? Why did you go to school and do uh, university degrees and courses and trainings and stuff? In the mind, none of, none of that is needed. Like a Buddha city, only nothing in the whole world. When you own something, you're afraid of letting it go. You don't own anything. Somebody once told me the bird sleeping on a tree at night, the more it relaxes, the more it's the claws on its feet grab into the wood of the branches. The more it relaxes, the more safe it is. Living in the forest all my life, I don't see birds laying in the uh, fallen down from the trees. And they relax and rest so well. Because the more they relax, the more their claws stick into the wood, and the safer they are. Just like you. The more you relax, the more you stay still in this present present moment, the more safe you become. Seems like a Buddha sitting under the tree, perfectly still, not because you want to be still, but because you make yourself still. You realize that stillness it's natural, like a default state. When you're not, I have to do something, then don't do anything. Imagine what stillness feels like inside. The emotion of peace, nowhere to go. Nothing to achieve, nothing to prove to others. This moment, so empty, and so perfect, so peaceful. I 
Most of my life I've spent doing stuff. Doing stuff, pleasing others, making things happen. If you're enlightened, imagine you're enlightened, there's nothing more to be done. Nothing to be done. You've broken through. Peace, safety. What more do you need? Just sitting here, just be aware, not wanting anything in the whole world, not needing anything in this whole world. Free, free from wanting, free from any idea of imperfection. Here you are, at peace with this. You don't try and work it out as a philosophy. This is an emotional truth which you feel is power. You have a taste of freedom. The taste of freedom is so delicious. Just imagining you're enlightened, what it must feel like. Be at peace, not wanting anything ever again. Your duties to the world are just showing it can be done. Hopefully that emotion of peace, nothing more to be done, nothing needed, brings the sense of peace to your mind. Well, you're not trying to get something in meditation, you're not trying to get rid of things. You enjoy this being here, free from the hindrances. Remember that fifth hindrance of doubt. Don't doubt the reality of now. You're experiencing this is true for you. Being here, like a Buddha. Excuse me again, I have to be quiet now. Stillness reminds me to be quiet.
And then close to the end of this meditation period now. How do you feel? This peace. Stillness, contentment. How strong are those? How does your body feel? When you're ready, open your eyes. And come out of the meditation. Beautiful to be able to feel this peace, the stillness, and the joy of it. What more do you want in the world? Okay. So that's that's what Buddha guided meditation to begin with. And letting people be free afterwards. Okay. So, see you again in a couple of hours. Bye bye. <laughs> Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs>